This is the BBC. My castaway this week is the comedian Jimmy Carr. His default approach to life is swimming against the tide. In an era of relentlessly observational comedy, he tells tightly crafted jokes with proper punchlines. At a time when hoodies and trainers are standard fashion issue, he favours bespoke Savile Row tailoring. And as the modern media increasingly preoccupies itself tiptoeing around the sensibilities of society, he positively revels in the inappropriate, with his gigs punctuated not just by audience laughter, but sharp intakes of breath too. His work ethic is extraordinary, around 250 live gigs a year, plus a lot of TV. Comedy came into his life as Catholicism exited. The son of Irish immigrants, he was brought up in Berkshire, going on to study at Cambridge. But by his mid-twenties, he'd experienced something of an early midlife crisis, throwing in his marketing job at Shell and giving up on religion too. He is clearly a thinker, but says, there is no lesson to be learned from my shows, no takeaway aha moment. I'm trying to release endorphins by making people laugh. I'm not sending any message and I'm not running for office. So welcome, uh, Jimmy Carr. You've been doing stand-up now for around about... What's wrong? You look That's a great introduction. I don't feel like I need to be here. Just play the songs and I'll go. That's everything, right? (laughs) You've been doing stand-up for 15 years now. Your tours have names like Barefaced Ambition, Charm Offensive, Gag Reflex, Repeat Offender. And yet you... (laughs) You've got to call them something. Mm -hmm. You say there's no message... To me, the message seems to be free speech is important. I don't think it is. I mean, I've got quite a dark sense of humour, like they're edgier jokes or they'd be seen as, you know, taboo to, to some. You find your audience, so they come to yeah. see the show. You're not, I'm not shouting these jokes through people's letterboxes. <laughs> They've come to see the show. They're literally buying into it. You know, when they're taken out of context and reprinted yes. in a the paper, then there's a big media storm and you kind of go, oh, right, but then... But everyone in that room laughed because it was... So there's that... something of the consensual activity at your gig. It's like we're all he- we all know what we're here for. Yes, and you sort of learn early on, never defend a joke because it's a joke. It's not a statement. Does it bug you then when, as, as does happen, I mean, relatively often that, that the press will take something that you have said at a gig and go to the group of people at whom... It includes those people might be amputees, those people might be uh, people involved in rape crisis centre and say, what do you think of what Jimmy Carr said? Does that bug you when that happens? Uh, not, not so much. If you sort of believe in free speech, if you think I've got the right to say that, mm. then they've got the right to be offended. Mm. Just because they're offended doesn't make them right. Part of reasoned debate. No one should be making, drawing a line and saying, well, that's OK and that isn't OK. There should be reasoned debate. And if they're upset by it, so be it. Because no one remembers the jokes. No, they don't. You know, the thing about offensive is, you know, people talk about, well, it's an offensive joke or I was offended by that. And you go, well, the people that come and see my show aren't offended because they don't remember what I said. No one ever remembers what you say. They remember how you make them feel. And at the end of two hours, they feel quite joyful and giddy and they've been to see a comedy show and they laughed a lot at all the jokes. It is that thing of being, you're the drug dealer and the drug I deal in is already on them. It's releasing the endorphin that's already in there, and that's and laughter is such a social thing. It's part of who we are. I mean, it predates language. It's it's an amazing, it's a gift. And so, who is your sounding board for the material? Oh, the audience. I constantly have a file on my phone. I'm constantly. I'll be halfway through a dinner, going right. I've got to just write down. I've had a half an idea for something. Right. And it's that thing of I never edit when I'm trying to be creative. Always write. Never refuse the muse is the line, isn't it? You yeah. you just if you think anything might be funny, write it down. Let's hear your first one then. What what are we going to hear? Kanye West, Stronger. It's just so positive. I don't think there's any other gift in life as good as having a positive disposition, being a happy person. And it hasn't always been that way, but I'm I'm a very happy person. I don't know what he's talking about.
A song has never been introduced in that voice before. How would you like me to do it? <laughs> that was Kanye West and Strong. I mean, it feels like... I can like only it... be who I am. <laughs> Um, the summer of 2012, you'll remember it, of course, you were embroiled in a big tax scandal. This was front-page stuff. Even the, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, made a statement on it. Um, you'd taken part in this tax avoidance scheme. It wasn't illegal, but by many people's estimation, it was immoral. You didn't make a joke out of it at the time, which was interesting to me. You apologised. You apologised quickly and succinctly. You said you were apologising for your, your lack of judgement in getting involved in it. Is that fair? Yeah, no, yeah. That, that's exactly what I said. If the Prime Minister of the country that you live in breaks off from the G20 summit in Mexico, he's in a meeting with the 19 most important people in the world and he comes out and makes a press statement about your tax affairs, that is going to need dealing with right now. Yeah, you are a man who doubtless has a team. I mean, you know, you'll have a, a manager, I guess, you have an agent's office, you maybe have somebody who deals with your publicity. When I read the statement at the time... It sounded like you'd written it. I wrote the statement and I think you've got to, like... You didn't get advice from anyone? I got advice from friends, but, I mean, most of the advice was you just keep quiet, this will go away in a couple of days. But as soon as the Prime Minister comments on something like that, you've got to get out in front of it. And also, you need to own it. Sometimes when footballers do, are involved in these things, people kind of go, well, he probably didn't know what was going on and he got advice. I don't think anyone was buying that line with me. I think people thought he probably knew what he was doing. Yes, because this you know, is a smart was, guy who passes comment, who's articulate, you know, and, and who's I educated. I said in the statement, you know, if someone comes to you and says, look, do you want to pay less tax? It's totally legal. You can do this thing. And if it ever comes up, you just have to pay them. You go, yeah, fine, great. In the end, you make good. You, you have to go back and say, right, I'll pay every penny of tax I ever owed. What did you learn about yourself from that? I think the greatest thing it taught me was when you have a friend in trouble, call. Mm -hmm. That was the big lesson. If you have a friend and they're in the paper or they're having a problem with something and you don't know what to say or someone's just died or someone's been diagnosed with something, call them. But quite a lot of people call again and again every day for a couple of weeks just to check in. You all right? You okay? You, you dealing with that? When you're in the middle of that, like, oh, could this be a career ender? Could this be something where, oh, he's involved in a thing and now he's not on TV anymore, now he doesn't sell tickets anymore? You anticipated my next question, which was, you know, you are somebody who who has worked incredibly hard to get to where you are. You seem to enjoy your work very, very much. Was that the worst thing that could have happened, that that would have ended your career? Um, I guess. I mean, with something like that, that's the, that's the worst-case scenario. So, I mean, you know, even worst-case scenario, I've had a pretty good run. I mean, in you know, in showbiz terms, when you arrive, it's very exciting. Because fame, as a, as a comic, I think it's all about trajectory. It's like, it's, it's how famous are you now compared to where you were last year. And I've been at the same level for probably 12 years now. That's, that's very lucky to have a long, sustained career in showbiz. So it's going to disappear at some point. Some more music, Jimmy Carr. Tell me about this second one. What are we going to hear? Uh, the Stone Roses, I Am The Resurrection. Because? Because that's the album that came out when I was sort of leaving school. You know, friends got cars, we could borrow our parents' car... You could drive around and be free, and that's the soundtrack to those years. The, that, to me, reminds me of getting through school and the freedom of kind of, right, we're out of that now, and we kind of felt like mini grown-ups. That was the Stone Roses and I Am the Resurrection. I feel very self-conscious now when I'm back announcing these pieces of music, Jimmy Carr. I feel no, like... It's, it's, yeah, it's lovely. You were born in 1972, the middle son of three boys, born to Nora and Jim Carr. How much humour was there in the home growing up? My mum was incredibly funny. Was she? I mean, really, genuinely a very funny person and not in the way that I'm funny with jokes. I mean, just funny bones. Can you give me a flavour of her? I think it's fair to say she swore a lot like a sailor and like the stock phrases of like if you ever paid her a compliment if you ever said oh you look well she go, I look like a whore at a christening <laughs> right okay I mean I think you look nice uh, but and she was just like she really kind of lit up a room she was kind of a larger than life Irish lady a beautiful voice and, and really she was extraordinary obviously it's your mum and you think she's special but lots of my friends were friends with my mum quite apart from me I remember coming home from university and my friend sort of Jared and Giles would be round having tea 
with mum. And we go, well, what, what are you doing here? I was just hanging around. Did she have charisma? Yeah, like a, like a ton of charisma. And they were from Limerick, your parents. Did you go back there much? I go back there now. And, and Do you? And I go back to Ireland a lot and play a lot of gigs over there. I'm quite proud of... Uh, I've got an Irish passport and, you know... When I was growing up, I was very aware of being in an immigrant family. The sort of late 70s yes. and... The bombings, the time of the bombings in London. And yeah, all I, was, I re- really clearly remember an incident of someone sort of saying something um, racist to my mum in a newsagent when there was some IRA bombing or yeah. something and someone yeah. said something very sort of negative to my mum and sort of feeling like, oh, we not like everyone else. And that, on the one hand, that's, you know, a negative thing. And on the other hand, it makes you feel very special. And a Catholic family, where was Catholicism in, in the family? I mean, were you very well, regular? mum was very religious. We'd go on a Sunday, but not every Sunday. And but what? it was around. And, and I believed in the magic. But I believed. Were you, were you an intense little boy? Yeah, I think so. I think I was a little bit, yeah. It's an odd thing. You can't really change people's perceptions of who you are. And I'm aware of how I come across now okay. and how I appear. Right. It's, it's weird. When I look back at my childhood and, you know, that, that song representing kind of leaving school, school was not easy for me. I couldn't read until I was about sort of 10, 11 with any level of ability. I mean, I just, I just couldn't. And I was so fearful of getting up in front of the class and reading something out. I think the perception would be, oh, it was very easy for him. And the quick thing in an interview and even in the intro is, oh, you went to Cambridge. You go, yeah, the, the struggle to get there, though. And um, tell me then <laughs> about your next piece of music. We're going to hear your third. This is Paul Simon, The Obvious Child. And I used to go to the Slough Record Centre every Monday with my mum and we would buy records together. It was on the Farnham Road in Slough. You could see the Mars factory from there and the whole world smelled of chocolate when I was growing up. Mm. We would go and buy records and then we would take them home and we would play them and dance around the living room. And it was a real kind of ritual of kind of going, right, what are we going to get? And I really, really remember in our house getting this song home. And and weirdly, even now when I dance, there's a real family dance. We have a weird little groove shuffle thing that my mum used to do. That and That's exactly how I dance now. It almost makes me... the obvious question then, Jimmy Carr. You, the class clown. So the cliché goes that it all begins in school with comedians and that they win people round by making jokes in class. Were you that little boy? Um, I don't think so. I think if my school friends were listening to this, I don't think they would think, oh, well, yeah, he was much funnier than everyone else. You, you said to me a moment ago, I was 10 or 11 before I could read a book properly and, and most people would say, well, you know, I was a dyslexic kid. You notably did not say that. I've been diagnosed as having dyslexia, but I sort of think... You get to choose your narrative in life. You get to pick what you say and how you say it. And you can define yourself by things. You can be the kid who had dyslexia or you can be the kid that went to Cambridge. Well, you you can also be both. You can be, which is a rather remarkable bit of your tale, which is the kid who had dyslexia who got four A's. I did well. It was ridiculous to talk about my show off about my A-levels on Radio 4. (laughs) Brilliant. My mother would be so proud. Um, but we're kind of working this thing out. I mean, as you say, you know, I say it in the introduction, it's my li- and you said there, well, you know, people think my life sounded so easy, you know, brought up in Berkshire, went to Cambridge. Well, there's nothing about it that seems easy to me. If you were somebody who couldn't read a book till they were 10. I suppose it makes you sort of think early on, I can sort of do stuff. Exactly. I think sort of the great gift was I moved schools when I was 16. Right. And I think you become a prisoner of the past as a teenager. It's very difficult to kind of rewrite the book and go, well, I'm going to study hard now. And so you sort of reinvented yourself, did you? Yeah, totally. I arrived at the school, there's another new boy in my class. I think we we both come from sort of schools that aren't as good and we both kind of looked around and went, we could do really well here. And then there were two teachers that absolutely saw it. There was a guy called Mr Clay and a guy called Mr File that went, oh, you guys are really bright. You could do incredibly well. And we went, no, what? What, Who are you thinking of? And they went, yeah, yeah, you'd be fine. You applied to Cambridge, yeah. 
it was interesting that thing of like self belief. It often does come from someone else going, "You're going to be fine. Just do this." But such a pivotal thing. Let's have some more music, Jimmy Carr.、Uh, it's time for your fourth. I was obsessed by music when I was at college, and you played guitar and you sang in a band, right? Well, yeah, all of that kind of stuff, and, and really bought a lot of records. And the Pixies were a band that kind of carried me through. And I always thought they were just an incredible group. And this, this song—it's quite a hard song. It's where Kurt Cobain got the riff for "Smells Like Teen Spirit," and it, for me, it just kind of reminds me of all my kind of college years. That was the Pixies and UMass, and again, I'm guessing I said that wrong. No, I mean that's. Should I still say that was the Pixies and UMass? Yeah, a little bit、yes. more. Like, yeah. Is that better? <laughs> a little bit better. Yeah,、um, great. So you studied political science at Cambridge. What you... I did, yeah, social and political science. It was a bit like doing a general knowledge quiz as a degree. What are your strongest memories of your student days? I'm guessing it's probably not the studying. Yeah, I mean, I did okay. I, I think、uh, I probably could have done a little bit better if I'd worked a little bit harder in the last year, but. I mean, you're kind of busy, right? So, what were you busy doing? Because you were not having sex. No, not having sex. It was, you know, drinking fairly heavily. Yeah, late to sex. Very late to sex. Very later. Maybe twenty six. You lost your virginity at twenty six. I、yeah. read. I read. This is not. I, know, I mean, I read this. Yeah, about I know. You. This it was, is true. It was very, and thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it, and I really thank you.、Um, the, the.、Uh, No, yeah, it was later. I quite like talking about that though, because I sort of think when I really remember being a teenager and thinking, "This is I'm not normal. I'm weird." I think maybe the religion playing into it, and and not meeting the right person, not meeting that you know, I don't know. You say you don't know what that was. That, that's that seems odd to me. I think I was a little bit kind of repressed. You took your religion at its word.、Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I would have been fine. A slightly late developer, I think, with the reading as well, and I'm okay with that. It's quite nice to talk about it on the radio because you sort of feel like, well, someone will be listening. Of course, and plenty. Going, yes.、Ah, yes. Hang on, what's happening? It's it's fine. It's you、yeah. know. When was the beginning of the doubt over Catholicism? It was probably at college. It started. I remember my friend Henry and I talking a lot about Darwin. And then you get very interested in that, and sort of think, "Oh, that, that's amazing! That's the the story of life." And then you're with people that are studying natural science at Cambridge, so you you go to a couple of lectures, and you you sort of hear about it, and you go, "Wow, that's extraordinary!" And then a little bit of doubt creeps in. The final straw was thinking about, well, everyone doesn't believe in most gods, and just taking it one further, but thinking, well, if I'm right about this god, all the others are wrong, and that struck me as an incredibly arrogant viewpoint. So if I'm right about this one, all these other guys are idiots. But it happened very slowly. It wasn't like、yes. in one conversation course, I went,、uh, yes. I went, oh, it's it,、yes. the, the scales have fallen from my eyes.、Yeah. In reverse, maybe the scales are on. And when it went, there was a real sense of loss. You didn't go and talk to priests, or you didn't talk. No, to I never. I never. Never told my mother. You never told your mother. I think it would have broken her heart. I, I, I couldn't have. The fact that it went just before she died was really. Because that, and I really felt like when she left, it was oh, that's when I needed it. That's when it would have been really nice to think, oh, she's up there somewhere, and no. And it made me want to work harder and kind of put more into life, because this is it. And what age were you then when she died? Twenty six, twenty seven, something around then. Yeah. I mean, I still find myself now doing things, thinking, oh, she'd like this. You, I mean, even being here today on Desert Island Discs, she'd love that. Tell me about your next piece of music, Jimmy Carr. What are we going to hear? It's Death Cab for Cutie. I will follow you into the dark. For me, it's kind of a, an atheist hymn, and you know I do miss the singing. Church singing. Yeah, when you lose your religion, you kind of look like all the best songs for hundreds of years were all about God. I mean, they're all about love now. But this to me feels like it's a it's kind of a nice thing to be an atheist. I think.
Jimmy Carr, I'm I'm so interested in so much of what you've just told me, and I'm very interested in this idea that you you abandoned a life, and it's a life that that a lot of people well, you'd worked hard enough to get there. You know, you'd got your degree. You got. I'm sure getting a job at Shell was a big deal. I'm sure it was a really pretty well rewarded job. I'm very keen on on quotes, and there's one I really like: "The good is the enemy of the best." And I had a really good life, but it didn't feel like it was all that I could be. So the courage to tear it all up, the courage to say, I put my religion to one side, I'm going to pursue this thing that, by anybody's estimation, it's a long shot. It seems like, looking back now, a terrifying decision to leave my job. But at the time, I just thought, I'm so miserable here. I just want to get out. But you yourself have described it as a sort of early midlife crisis. It's interesting. I like talking about being sad. Oh, I was sad at that stage. Yeah. Because I think the term depression is really, it's overused. Because people talk about being depressed when actually they're sad. If it's circumstantial, you're sad. And there's much more stigma to being sad than being depressed. Mm -hmm. But being depressed is a real thing. It's a chemical imbalance. And the people that have got it, I can't, it's always dismissed as, oh, just cheer up, mate. I didn't suffer with, with depression. I was lucky. I was just sad. And if you were just sad, you can kind of, you can do something about it. Can you tell me what was making you sad? I was kind of bored of my life. It's so simplistic on one level that I was sad and then I thought, I know what'll cheer me up. Jokes. <laughs> I mean I want to believe that. Is that but true? It's, well it's almost I mean I went and did loads of therapy. I wasn't interested in why. I was interested in what can we do now. The fundamental question with all the therapy I did was what do you want? And that strikes me as the most important question in life is what do you want? Finding out how to get it is comparatively easy. So you reprogrammed yourself? So you, you sort of thought, I'm programming myself for success? Not even for success. Looking back now, because of the way things have gone, it looks like I left my job to be on TV presenting game shows. Well, and, that doesn't and, work, you can't do but that. You, yeah. No, I left my job to go, well, I'm going to go to comedy clubs and hang out. And success came very early. But success, very early? I mean, that's success, the thing. It but came... success doesn't look like people think it looks. How does it look? Well, success for me was the Comedy Store in Leicester Square and I was doing a 20-minute show and I got paid 200 quid. And then there were three shows that weekend and you could double it with a banana, cabaret and ballam. And I went, right, fine. I'm absolutely fine. And I'm making money off my wits. I mean, quite literally. I just thought, well, that's, it's absolutely fine. Everything else is gravy. Did you ever s suffer nerves or self-doubt? Yeah, but... What's the great line? Pressure is a privilege. If you're dry heaving by the side of the Tonight Show set, going, I've got four and a half minutes to make it in America, you're on the Tonight Show. Come on. Have you done that? Yeah. How, the, did, how did it go? Amazing. To be clear, the sort of dry heaving, you were at the side of the stage dry oh, heaving. Oh, yeah, I yeah. mean, 100%, yeah. But you can easily lie to yourself and just go, oh, God, I was really excited about that gig. Remember how you couldn't eat for eight hours and you got sick a lot? <laughs> I love being excited, mate. <laughs> it's time for some more music, Jimmy Carr. Tell me about this. Bell and Sebastian, The Boy with the Arab Strap, is the song that best sums up my Edinburgh experiences. And I started doing comedy in London on the circuit. And then I, I, I heard about this thing called the Edinburgh Festival. I was vaguely aware at university of people going to Edinburgh in the summer and thinking, but it's not sunny. Go to France. It's really sunny. What are you doing? And, and just being totally unaware, being really ignorant of that. Uh, maybe I didn't listen to enough Radio 4 growing up. But... Suddenly then, discovering Edinburgh, going up there for the first time and doing these new act competitions and going, oh, this is, oh, like, like a paradise, like an absolute paradise. I'm kind of out of it now. But those years were just incredible. And this song, it was just always around. And for me, it really summed up Edinburgh. What did you learn from your time in the solitary cell of your mind? There was noise, the distraction from anything good. And the old Bell and Sebastian and the boy with the Arab strap. Uh, Jimmy Carr, where's the line that you will not cross? What would you not tell a joke about? I don't think there is a line. I think anything is fair game for comedy. and Anything? Yeah, pr pretty, pretty much, yeah. I mean, there's th things in very specific locales that you cannot joke about. 
but everything else is kind of fine and it's how you do it. It's about the intent. And is there a hypocrisy in that, do you think? You know, if you think, well, I'm in front of Liverpool fans, so I won't tell, we can all imagine what the certain areas that would well, be of it's, immense it's, sensitivity it's, there are. It's or very it... interesting, actually, you mentioned that. Yeah. Because you've absolutely hit the nail on the head. I would say the one thing that you could never joke about in the UK is is Hillsborough. It's a tragedy that's touched people in a very specific way and I cannot imagine anyone coming up with a joke about that. If you were to go to Aberfan or if you were to go to Dunblane, those communities would have been touched equally by horrendous tragedies in, you know, among people that were close and well-known to them. Why would those be different? I haven't sort of analysed it in any great detail, but it does strike me that it's a very... You know, most things heal with time to a degree, yes. and that hasn't. You can joke about religion, and I do often, and you can joke about death, you can joke about murders, and you can joke about disasters. And if comedy has any purpose other than the, the obvious social, it's remote tickling is what mm. laughter is. You know, you're building a social group. But if it has any purpose, it, you know, it does help people cope with stuff and, and, you know, make it OK. Let's have another piece of music. Tell me what we're going to hear now. Should we have The Killers? Let's have that. Uh, when You Were Young. It's a song that just really reminds me of kind of being on the road. It was kind of my walk-on music for a lot of years. The opening eight bars of this is great to walk on stage to. But also was in the car a lot, was, you know, travelling up and down the motorway. And the lyric of it just seems to be about looking back when you were young and where you've ended up and would you be happy with that. And I think I'm, I'm you know, it sounds smug, but I'm really pleased the turn that I took to, to do this with my life. Seems to be working out OK. Yes, all right, man. When you were young, the killers. Uh, Jimmy Carr, I read that uh, you met your girlfriend, you've been with Caroline now for 16 years, you met while you were auditioning. I was auditioning for a TV show, yeah, for a panel show, very early on in my career. OK, and she was in charge? She was one of the one of the producers of the show. And I read that afterwards you said to your agent that you couldn't possibly work on the show because you had found Caroline too attractive and that would be too distracting. I, I'm not a romantic guy, but I knew. I what knew. did she think of you? She literally wrote notes. So well, she was auditioning, nice. so she wrote notes. So we have the notes of what she wrote. She said, I was a, I was a one-note comedian uh, with the eyes of a sex offender, is what she wrote. She actually wrote that. We still got it. Yeah. She did not know. I knew. And I met her and just thought, this is just... It just felt like... It, it felt perfect. How did you win her round, then? I, d I think she only came out with me because... Uh, her boss, I now know, she was reading my emails to her out loud to the office and going, <laughs> shall I go out with this guy? And her boss went, well, it's a free meal. I mean, you know, you're not making a fortune. He'll buy you dinner. He seems nice enough. Does she come and watch your stand-up ever? Yeah, she used to come an awful lot early on and do a lot of notes and she didn't come as much now, but then it's, you know, it's, it's partly to do where, with where I am in the cycle of the tour. So if I'm doing a new tour... She might come along and sort of see one of the preview shows and, you know, what about that and what about that? She's always got kind of interesting notes and ideas on structure. Are you somebody who plans to always be working? Or do you think, is there an end game when you think, you know, when I've saved up enough money and I've, I've bought the yacht, I'm going to stop? No, I would, I would very much like to die with my boots on. Would you? Yeah, I've got no intention of stopping. The old and, sort of Tommy Cooper, you want to be there, you want to be on stage and you want to... Yeah, 100%, Ken Dodd, yeah, do it. I think if I wanted to stop and play golf, then I should have been a golfer. This is what I love doing. I love this life. You spoke of yourself at 25, 26, that pivotal moment in your life when everything was fine, but you didn't love it, you weren't present in it, you weren't engaged in it, and you seem somebody who is viscerally present in their life now. The first 10 years, it was almost thinking about it like it was a footballer's career and thinking, look, I've got a little window here. I felt like so old when I got into it. I felt like 26 was so old because people start when they're at college and I felt like I've got to catch up. I never wanted to look back and think, I didn't really work hard enough, I didn't really give that a, a go. If I was going to fail, I, d I didn't mind as long as I put everything into it. How on earth are you going to cope on this island? No people to entertain in auditoria, no girlfriend. Oh. 
the thing about being a stand-up comic is it's training for a desert island. I think I did 32 countries last year. And most of them, you know, travelling on my own, going there, doing gigs. You spend a lot of time on your own. You have to get good with your own company. I think I'd be all right. I mean, you know, dead in a week, obviously, same as everyone else on this island, but... Tell me about your eighth disc, Jimmy Carr. What are we going to hear? I think this is maybe the best pop record ever. It's partly about having friends over and this being on and feeling like, oh, this is like a dance floor filler and I'm going to do my little dance like my mum's dance and dance around the kitchen, having fun with friends. It's partly about that. And it's partly, it's a love song and it's the kind of love that I've experienced. I think I've been very lucky that it's been fun. It's a really upbeat love song and most love songs, especially on this show, are quite melancholy. There's a lot of ache. And I'm not a big fan of the ache. I'm a big fan of the fun, joyous party. So this is, you know, Beyonce crazy in love. That was Beyonce featuring Jay-Z and Crazy in Love. You can sit down now, Jimmy Carr. So we give you some reading materials. You get the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. Right. I mean, um, <laughs> yeah, OK. The, the, the Bible, I really don't. I mean, we could start the fire, couldn't we? we could... it, it's yours. You may do what you will with it. <laughs> and you get to take one other, one I mean, other book. Yeah. One other book. It's a very difficult question, this, because if you take it at face value, it's not about your favourite book, because... My favourite book, I've read. So how frustrating would it be to get to the desert island and you go, oh, there's one book, brilliant, that'll pass a day, and then, oh, I've read this. Like, it would be Raymond Carver's What We Talk About When We Talk About Love, it was favourite book. But wow. I don't think I would take that okay. because I know it and it's great, but it's... I've read it. I would take the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. OK, that's yours. You're allowed a luxury too. A luxury. Now, this makes life more enjoyable, more bearable. It's got to be something that isn't too useful. I've got a, a, a strange relationship with coffee. I love coffee. I started drinking coffee very early in life. I used to get given a bottle of quite sweet coffee in my cot when I used to go for an afternoon rest. It's terrible parenting, but, you know, it was the 70s. It was a different era. And uh, I would take a coffee machine. You may have that. If you had to choose just one of these discs to save, which one would it be? I think it would be the Death Cab for Cutie, I Will Follow You Into the Dark. It's yours. Jimmy Carr, thank you very much for letting us hear your Desert Island discs. Can't believe your luck. You've been listening to a download from the BBC. You'll find more information on the Radio 4 website, bbc.co.uk slash radio4. This is the BBC.